So this is, this is my, my fourth Think Monk talk. Um, last year I wrote a blog post about what I think about various IoT conferences because most of them are actually shit because you get fed a lot of marketing bullshit that does not really bring the field any further. So I wrote, when you design a conference around IoT, make sure that you're not just inviting your mates and the same speakers again and again and again. And yet, this is my fourth talk. So, you know. But there's an interesting perspective, and, and either Finton or James mentioned that earlier, and that is by inviting people that the community knows again and again, you see their development, you see how their business goes through different phases. And that might probably also be true a little bit for me. Although, when I first spoke to you, um, that was Boris the academic, and my stance was a little bit, give me 50 million pounds and I'm going to build you the best IoT ontology the world has ever seen. And I know that James tweeted as well, um, just about an hour ago, that he doesn't want to see the Gartner bullshit cycle, but here it goes, um, talking about inflated expectations. Back then, I might have been here. I'm going to get rich with IoT. And um, yeah, I've moved on a little bit since then. So last year I was Boris the freelancer and I said, well, if you want to pay five million for machine learning, make sure it isn't road to your users. That was also an important message, I think. And this year I go yet an order of magnitude lower. I say, don't pay anyone half a million pounds for your IoT solution. I can show you how to do this for half. So we, we start with something that we all know. Peanuts. So let's say this is not Thing Monk, but some posh restaurant, and together with your glass of wine, you get a spoonful of peanuts. Now, how many pe peanuts are that? So I asked three people here, and I might get 40, 60, and 75. And well, on average, I have probably, I don't know, 55 peanuts. Okay? So we repeat this exercise, and I say, well, do I get more peanuts at a Thing Monk or at a Monkey Grow conference? So again, I do this on average thing. I've asked pe three people at Thing Monk, and I asked three people at Monkey Gras. And well, it seems that on average, there are more peanuts in a bowl at Monkey Gras. Okay, so which one is the better conference? I ask you. Now I'm asking a fourth person. Those averages move closer to each other. I ask another time. I, I take N samples. I love N. All data scientists love N. So I do this, and it seems that on average, there's the same number of peanuts in my bowl, whether I go to Monkey Gras or to Thing Monk, which is a good thing. So we get statistical power through a large number of samples. Okay? So in my trade, we just love large sample sizes. More is better, yeah? The problem is that, say, once again, we're going back to the example in the bar, getting many glasses of wine costs a lot of money, so we can't necessarily afford that. So time and resources always work against us, so we need to find a compromise, and the same is true for IoT. So we need to get, we need to find a reasonable sampling strategy. So there's a precision and an accuracy that can theoretically be achieved and there is a precision and accuracy that's needed to get the job done. And very often, when we come from a technical perspective, we, we tend to forget that because we want to get the best that's humanly possible. So accurate and precise is great, but very often not affordable. Precise but not accurate, that's not what we want. But accurate but not precise might be a reasonable compromise for your application. And this is where I'm moving into my corporate talk because I'm now a corporate man. So deployment patterns and analytic strategies to maximize your profit. So when German SMEs were asked, you were convinced that IoT might be the solution to many of your problems, why aren't you doing it yet? About 40% responded that they are worried about upfront investment because they don't know what to expect with IoT. So this talk in a way is sweetening IoT for your customer. And I come up with a few recommendations from the trenches. A first one, how to cut down hardware cost. And this is an example that I started with, with Yodit from Open Sensors. Again, this is a great example how the London community has really helped people 
to, to do IoT together. Because we, get, we had our first contact through the IoT meetup, and then a little bit later through ThingMonk, and, and that really got it all started. And then I have a second example how to cut down on software cost. So the example I'm going to talk about today is the Westminster parking trial. So there's this company called Smart Parking. I think they're based out of Australia. They have an IoT solution that essentially places a detector into the ground. It sees when a car is parking, sends that message to some sort of gateway, and the, the parking status, the occupancy status, ends up in the cloud. So there's a man in the middle, and the man in the middle in that case is called Ethos. They're a service company, and they provide access to about 750 independent parking lots with a total of about 3,500 individual parking spaces around London. So the question is, can we learn an optimal deployment and sampling pattern from this data? So these sensors sample at a rate of about five to 10 minutes. We had data over two weeks in May 2015, and overall of uh, about 2.6 million data points. And the question was really, can we make their budget go further well, not when we accept this as a final deployment, but really just a start of a journey. So, given the same budget and the same number of sensors, could we find a better deployment pattern in order to find out occupancy in a larger area of London? And secondly, can we probably lower the sampling rate because these things are battery driven? So, when the battery breaks down, they need to be dug out, battery replaced, dug back in. So essentially, the sensor is the cheap bit, and labor becomes the expensive bit. So this is where you have to optimize on your deployment. So I'll go back to the very basics. What's correlation? So you have two data types. So here, some, something on X, something on Y. You have two different curves. When they're roughly the same, we, we call them correlated. I mean, for most people, that's, that's fairly sort of intuitive. I, I want to show it nevertheless. So when there's like no pattern and you can't find any relationship between those two, you say that they are independent of each other, right? And then there's anti-correlation. So while this curve here goes strictly upwards, this one goes strictly downwards. This was a demo on normal numbers. You can even do correlation for binary vectors. So here, we would, on the basis of a feature matrix, say lorries and coaches and bikes and skateboards are built pairs on the basis of the number of wheels they have, on the, um, on the feature that they have a motor, for example, et cetera, et cetera. So we can use correlation to build these clustering graphs. So the good news is, the temporal occupancy of parking lots, so essentially all the data over two weeks, when we plot this, somehow tells us roughly the, 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 the pattern of where they are located. So parking lots that are close to each other tend to have the same sort of occupancy behavior. Sort of intuitive, right? So you park somewhere and, and quite typically in that road where you park, just around the corner, this is the same number of parking spaces available. So here in that case, that's a, a sort of very tasty sort of visualization. So rather than having this, this linear clustering graph that I showed you before, we're here drawing the 750 elements in a, in a circle. And when I zoom in here, what we, what we identify is there's this set of outliers here. And in fact, those were a couple of outlier um, parking lots in Southampton. So we use those as a, as a control. Whereas those guys here, where you see the clustering is, is a little bit denser, um, those were located in the same sort of geographic area in London. Now there's a caveat. Because depending on how many parking spaces you have in a lot, you might find a higher degree of correlation. Um, so here, this describes the parking pattern over a 24-hour period. And so here we would say in a parking lot of 20 spaces, we have occupancy of 5, 10, 15, or 20 different parking spaces. Now, plus minus of a single parking space 
doesn't really change the pattern of that curve, okay? So it's much more likely if we have large parking spaces to get a higher degree of correlation. Whereas if we have smaller parking, space, uh, parking lots with just three spaces, then the change of one or two makes quite a difference. So purely mathematically, we cannot achieve the same good correlation. So we need to, to correct for that in order to not fall into a trap of, of using the wrong sort of metric. So here in that case, we then took all of these parking lots. I really, I really hate the sort of semantic around parking lots with parking spaces. It, it always confuses me. But essentially, for each geographic area, we then just swapped the occupancy states. So we would take a parking lot with, say, seven spaces, and we would just randomly, from somewhere in London, draw another parking lot of seven spaces. And we would do this systematically in order to see how likely it is that certain correlation patterns occur, and in which cases we would break that correlation because the correlation would simply occur on the basis that there were just large parking lots. So in the end, we, we could suggest that about one third of the sensors that had been deployed would have been sufficient in the Westminster parking trial. And there are a couple of patterns that can be, that can be used. So say if all of these orange ones are parking spaces that are, or, well, these are individual lots, okay? And, the, and, and, and those are spaces that are equipped with sensors. Now, if we get rid of all of those that are marked with X, with that pattern, it might be better for navigation if I want to give people like last minute updates in order to, to get to their, to their target, to their destination. Whereas with this sort of pattern, when we would take out those with X, we would have better predictive, uh, overall predictive power. So what's the technology behind this? In the case of the Westminster parking trial, it had already happened. Our suggestion was that essentially a simple clipboard technique, like you know, sending people around the road for two weeks, making strokes whenever there is a parking space occupied, probably would have given us sufficient data in order to deploy, uh, in order to develop uh, the best sort of deployment pattern for these sensors, because in areas where it's already clear that if one lot is occupied, all of the others are going to be occupied as well. Um, you really just need indicator spaces. You don't need to know about every single position. Whereas in, in Soho, where parking is freaking expensive, um, the parking spaces would really show more sort of like stochastic behavior and you couldn't predict how they're going to be occupied. Monte Carlo simulations are generally great tools to assess the business value in IoT. So here, just in this example, you have a sum, sum base and you have, you have assets all around. Now the question is, should you have a weekly tour of all these assets and visit them and query them for some activity or take action for, for something, although you might not have the need, or should you query your assets using an IoT solution and then just have a sort of demand-driven visitation pattern. And again, clipboarding and a little bit of thinking might, might solve this, this problem for you. So this talk is a bit about unfounded IoT fears. And what I've seen already is that very often people are happy to invest a lot of money into the hardware because hardware is something that they can understand. And hardware is expensive because so obviously my IoT solution must swallow a lot of, of cost in terms of hardware. Now, when it comes to analytics, there's like, oh, uh, analytics is math and it's magic. It must be expensive. I don't understand it. I am afraid. Also, my data problem must be special. So they fear cost because they have unstructured data, so something we've seen in the last talk. Um, they have a hunch that they might need distributed ingestion and storage. Um, and I always say, like, you know, my company went to an IT conference and all I got was this t-shirt and, and a bunch of buzzwords. So also from hearsay, people have unreasonable expectations what they actually need in terms of analytics. So yeah, everyone needs real-time analytics, right? Everyone needs deep learning and machine learning these days. Well, 
The fact, in fact, sometimes the question, or better, the answer to the question is you need an if statement. You don't need machine learning. So just to address this real-time analytics thing, and in a way, Stefan showed this slide already yesterday. So take this drone. If you have to react to something in microseconds or seconds, like, you know, the sensors experience the thing is in trouble, am I falling? You might use a Kalman filter. Yeah, it's sort of real time, but it happens on the device. If you have something that happens in seconds to minutes, and I call that operational insight, like the battery level, should I land now or not, that you can deal, that you can actually uh, tackle with a, with, a, with a rules engine on stream. But if your time frame is more minutes to hours or hours to weeks, so that's like performance insights or strategic insight, then you need summary stats or machine learning. And you can, in many cases, just do this in batch. There's no need for real time here. And the question is now, I mean, how real time can IoT ever be? Of course, here in that case, I'd say, well, you know, if you're a director in the, in the device, you might do real time, probably in the microsecond range, if you have a good embedded engineer. If you want to do real time here, when stuff has already arrived at some sort of gateway, yeah, you do real time in milliseconds. But in the cloud, like, I don't care that stuff takes minutes, seconds, because the latency into the internet is totally unpredictable. So where do we do stuff? So we can do our analytics on edge, so essentially on the drone. We can do it on the gateway, so that's famous fog computing, or we can do it in the cloud. The con, the con against doing it in fog, uh, doing it as fog or edge computing is that you're losing information. You will never be able to do proper machine learning on the, all the small important bits of information if you're discarding that info and you're not transmitting it back to your cloud. But there are many reasons to do analytics in these scenarios, okay? But it is harder to program that. Whereas in the cloud, every reasonable developer can do that now, but you have a lot more traffic. So there are plenty of options to do stuff in the cloud. And I always say, well, you know, you can either do it yourself, like Dominic and Tarek would say. So they would build on the SMAC or whatever stack. Um, if you know how to configure that, then that's great. It's cheap, it's open source, you're set. The problem is a badly configured SMAC is slower than MongoDB on a Raspberry Pi. Now, you can do platform as a service, but from the perspective of our potential customers, they're not in IT. So they may open an account, but then very often encounter a situation where they don't quite understand what they're activating. It might be more expensive than actually talking to middleware providers, so like our company or probably open sensors, um, who can build these things quite efficiently because there's a, a already prepared set of functions that we can reutilize in, in each and every IoT solution. So I'm coming to my pet hate. That's deep learning at the moment. Deep learning has really delivered great results over the last couple of months. Just think about how AlphaGo has, has beaten the, the sort of, what you call them, grandmaster um, in, in Go, or here in that case, deep learning can, can do art, can mimic art, right? Or you can show a deep learning algorithm pictures of things and it can say, well, you know, there's one flower between 100 dogs. So that's great. Also, there are frameworks that you can very easily utilize, probably in Python or any other programming language, that make deep learning very easy. That means that even script kiddies now can use deep learning without having any understanding of the underlying mathematics and also no idea about how to use this and how to interpret the results because proper machine learning is also about getting the right sort of metric for your problem and that you don't get from deep learning. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Uh, Surveys, so preliminary surveys, data analysis on preliminary data and simulation can really help to optimize deployment patterns and to decide how often you need updates and how much data you need in order to tackle your problem. 
faster analytics on bigger and better hardware does not automatically solve your problems, and it might not be the most useful solution. And a good understanding of what you actually want to achieve is quite helpful in order to, to save that money. And with that, because pitching is not allowed at Ningmonk, I finish. <laughs>